interview is being conducted on Thursday, July 6, 2006 at Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachy. I am, oh, I forgot to ask how to pronounce your last name. Dicheco. My name is Kate Wallachy. I am speaking with John Dicheco. Mr. Dicheco was born on May 24, 1922 in Omaha, Nebraska and now lives in Niles, Illinois. Mr. DeCecco learned of the Veterans History Project through a speaker at the Niles Senior Center. Was that where you were? No. Yes. He has kindly consented to be interviewed for the project. Here is his story. Now, you have a list. Well, you want to tell us about it? We've got just uh, a list of uh, 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 swearing, sw in. swearing in ceremony, uh, Camp uh, Wallace, Texas, where I was trained. Oh, so tell me about I it. I got all the different things, so I don't know if, if that's too much. No, not at all. Well, when you you went into the army, you were drafted into the army. I was drafted in '43, uh, January 6th, and uh, the draft board was just a few blocks up from our house on Kedzie Avenue, from uh, not too far from Wicker Park. We used to go to Wicker Park, and uh, I told the doc. Well, you won't have to go with me because I tried to join the Navy and they rejected me. They said I had a, a murmur of the heart. Hmm. And he examined me and he says, no, your heart's perfect. They'll, they'll take and they'll take me in which way they want, <laughs> I guess. So uh, I went home the next day. I went downtown to get sworn in at the building. And then we had a day or two off. And then we went downtown again. We had some cab to take us to the train station, and then the train station took us to Camp Wall, uh, Camp Wall, uh, no, Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And uh, it was January, so it was six below zero. Uh, we were out standing in line in our long johns and overcoat going to Chow Line. I figured that, that's not quite right, but, but if we're hungry enough, we'll put up with it. So uh, after that, I, uh, oh, some some young kid took it upon himself to be uh, acting sergeant because he wanted to be sergeant. I didn't know that. And uh, I was breathing out in hives for a year or two, dollar-sized hives all over me, just nervous condition. They couldn't find. I was allergic to everything, so it was a nervous condition. And he says, "Don't worry, kid. You'll go home." Well, it turned out that he's the one that went home, and they kept me. <laughs> so. And then from then, we uh, went on, oh, we, they put us on the truck, took us to the train station, and headed for Texas. And on our way to Texas, we uh, stopped in North Platte, Nebraska. We all got in, in line and marched through town, and people were there were applauding, you know, like, you know, here's the big heroes. <laughs> <laughs> and they took us to a big hotel for our lunch. And then from then on, we Took another two days to get to Texas. A, a desolate spot where nothing grew. And uh, the smell of uh, seashell was real sweet smelling. They, I guess they filled in the swamp and built a camp right on top there. But it was very interesting. I, I, uh, they were training me for a telephone lineman. Lineman had these 50 foot holes, you know. And there was a couple of guys that were in the business already at home. They would run up and run down. I would, by the time they did that, I was still halfway up. You know, <laughs> getting there. So uh, then, uh, well, anyway, then came a time that they're going to ship us out. And uh, I was called in from the field to for an interview at, at an office that they tried to see if I was fit to go in range finder. It's a unit they could pick up the plane and see the range so they can give it to the enemy aircraft. And uh, well, anyway, nothing came of that. I got on the ship. Oh, got on the train, went to Chicago for a few hours. We stopped and uh, had some a sergeant assigned a couple guys to watch him. He said, this guy's from Chicago, but you better watch him. You might want to slip and go home, see. And uh, but uh, anyway, I loved train train riding, so it was perfect. And uh, so we ended up going to New York, uh, a place called Camp Shanks, a brand new camp, 
the ground was a real white brown. It was almost like the, the ground in Colorado where my wife's from, and uh, we visit there quite often. And uh, we had a lieutenant that was in charge of us. He was in the, in the infantry, and, but he said, don't get excited. I'm in the infantry, it doesn't mean you guys are going to be. We're, you know, so, uh, but they promised a, a three-day leave in New York by the end of the week. The end of the week came around, we took off, not for New York, but for the, uh, the ship docks. Oh. And so we, we were at the dock with um, three or four hundred guys with the uh, same amount of nurses waiting all the way to get on this little ship. Wow. And um, uh, the name of the ship was Uruguay. Yeah, you gave me a picture. Yeah, that, uh, that ship it had a, a pretty good life. It, it started in Uruguay as a luxury, a little luxury liner with about maybe 300 people first class and about 100 to 200 second class. And then it went shipped to Spain for the Spanish-American war there. It caught fire and they salvaged it, sent it back to Uruguay and it got caught fire again and sunk and they raised it and it was in in 43, they raised it, and they were going to send it out for scrap. Well, that's, see, so we go on the scrap ship. It's, a, you know, but it was a, it was a smaller ship, but the fastest. It could outbeat anything, the submarines, anybody. But because of the slower ship, and the, they were in the three ship convoy. And uh, when we could see the other ships, that the bow was going underwater and coming up. I figured that's what we're doing, you know. We're bobbing like corks, and uh, uh, we, uh, we well, we had one incident where well, I slept. Well, it took us 31 days from New York to uh, to Australia. Oh, uh, I only slept one day, and the rest was always along the railing on deck, <laughs> just a GI blanket on the bottom. And, and when it rained, we all ran in for it to get out of the rain. And when it stopped, we all ran back to make sure we got a spot again. It was, it was fun. We used to watch the flying fishes zoom from, you know, wave to wave. And uh, of course, we're spying like, we can see if we can see a submarine or a torpedo or something like that. We're always visualizing something. And uh, had good meals though. The Navy fed us good. Yeah. And, uh, what do you remember eating? Um, pork and beans. Over oh, one time, some of the guys got sick. We had scrambled eggs and green peas. And when they saw that, they <laughs> they wanted to barf. And I, I mean, that was terrific. Um, we go down the hold at the stand-up table, and I got to my side and swung out past the porthole. About that time, some water comes shooting through like a water gun. Knocked the tree out of his hand. And so it was a little excitement here and there. Uh, I pulled guard duty that one night uh, next to a 50 caliber, which I never fired. And it was so dark I couldn't see it. And I couldn't see the ship or nothing. So I said, we're just here for nothing. But it's our, our turn to pull guard duty. So when we, we landed in Bora Bora for a couple of couple of days. Uh, I think we had trouble with, one of the ships had trouble, so they had to have some welding to be done. And um, we saw a column of smoke not too far from us. It was a, a, a damage that was inflicted by, I guess by the Japanese or something. They happened to get in a good strike on us and burned up a few accessories, I guess. So we went on and hit, uh, went to uh, New Zealand. We weren't going there. We dropped off some, some troops and continued to Australia. And that's where we, we, we had our home there for, what, two months or so, four months. 
And they put us in the middle of a racetrack called Camp Ascot. Uh, casualty Replacement Depot. But I never registered Casualty Replacement. It was just a replacement, you know, we're too dumb, we're too excited with all the things going. And uh, finally, uh, or, oh, I met a fellow there, and give him this chow. I worked with him in Weevil store. I got, my first job I got in the stock room, and he worked up there, and I, I told the bosses, I don't, I'm not satisfied with this job. It happened to be a, 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 a vacancy in the camera department on the first floor. Just for one man, to me, that's great, because I was nuts about photography. And uh, I uh, well, get, get to wear a tie, a white shirt, and I, I was the, well, that was, the, that was near the end of the year of 41 when December 7th broke out. And um, some of the boys I met in New Guinea uh, had uh, been in peacetime for one year. They were allowed to go one year. And they were ready to come out when Pearl Harbor broke out, so they got stuck. So they so they spent maybe four or five years where I only spent three years. And um, uh, well, then, then then from there on, that's when we, I tried to get in the Navy a number of times. Uh, one time, so you got a curvature of the back. So I, went to, uh, I was in school. And that's from riding a bike. You ride on one foot, and your back is twisted. Uh, so I took calisthenics, got that corrected. Well, then he says, uh, you're too young. I was 17. I said, okay. I, I want to get the Navy Reserve. Uh, out of Glenview. So you, that was in 1939, 1940? Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, uh, oh, when I went to Glenview, to get, get in the reserve there, uh, they said, yeah, we can use a couple of guys. Look at my boys, and we pedal out to Dundee about, what is it, maybe 25 miles out from us. Uh, we can use a guy to drive a miniature gas truck, you know, load up the gas up the planes. I never know how to drive, you know, what the heck. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, yeah, then we decided to try to uh, uh, sign up for the Navy there. And he'd take out the information, then he says, uh, how old are you? I says, 17, he said, no, you gotta be 18. I says, okay, I missed it again. Uh, and to work there, it, that'd be a long job to pedal your bike. So we figured, okay, we'd be making maybe $30 a week. 25 would go for the room and board. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd have whatever left for whatever. So we gave that up and decided to stay in school. Uh, I was on the track team for, for a while. And uh, there was one fellow that um, his grades were bad. Mine was good, as dumb as I was. But uh, he says, come on, John, let's go and join the Navy. I'd love to, but I, I don't want to quit my third year, you know, or the end of the second, one on third. Uh, he said, well, I'll go. OK. He went. and. Uh, during the year, we found out his ship was a, one of the first ships, a, a destroyer that was sunk in the Atlantic when we were convoying uh, ships, you know, cargo ships to, uh, to England and stuff. And uh, so if I had gone with him, who knows, I could have been lucky enough to be with him, I would be <laughs> interviewing. You would be here. Yeah. So uh, it's. Um, well, after, after uh, we got to Australia, Australia was real. Have you ever been to Australia? Nice people. And then, of course, I had to apprentice girls, of course. But uh, nice people. The towns look like, like here. So you swear you were in the States, except if you looked at their trains, narrow gauge, real small. Oh, oh gee. Uh, but, uh, and then they had, uh, uh, Aborigines living in different houses, you know, and they'd be out in the park tripping us coming off the ship, you know. And uh, so um, we finally got shipped. We were going to New Guinea. 
He landed on good enough island, the nicest island you've ever watched. But no mosquitoes around. We, we had mosquito netting on, you know, on our bunks, and um, uh, oh yeah. So uh, all right. Before, as we're coming to it, uh, the captain didn't know where we were supposed to go. He said, well, here, go pick this, this island. Let's, let's park it here. We unloaded. I forget, maybe we had about maybe 150 guys that came out and stood in, in a bunch. A captain from each end of the island came in. They split us in half. This bunch went with him. The other A battery went with this guy, and B battery went with the other. So we ended up in front of the regular searchlight, sound locator searchlight uh, battalion. And they also had a radar, which was an old radar, but it was new to them. So they, they gave us a Cook's tour, they gave us a, a chance to pick what we wanted to get into. I said, hey, I'll try the radar, that sounds good. So it was good. You, you were able to tell where the planes were way before anyone else, you know, that was, and uh, so, we went, headquarters was just a two blocks from the airstrip, and so we went up to maybe a mile up the hill, and uh, they didn't have any place for us to sleep, so we had our hang uh, was, so, uh, our, um, not, not a, not the hammock, we later on we got that. Like a cot? Yeah, the cots, you know, so I knew it up to a minute ago. <laughs> The cot, and they set us up right up. next to this. It's a, it's a, it's a power plant that power, that powers the radar. Mm. A four cylinder, no muffler, so you could hear it. <laughs> you could hear the muffler. Okay, so we're sleeping online. Oh, and oh, these guys, they got a lot of brains. They're trying to get us deaf, so we don't hear nothing. <laughs> and, uh, but as we slept, when the engine was starving of gas, because it was running out of gas, we all woke up. See, so. Mm -hmm. It got reversed. The noise didn't bother us, but the quiet did. So anyway, we finally got a chance to build a platform and put up our tent. And uh, we, we acquired a, a white cat, we called her Alice, our mascot. She had seven kittens, and there were seven different units. So we gave her each uh, cat, so that accounts for our nine lives that we had <coughs> in there. And uh, where we were situated, we could look right down at the airstrip, which was just a few blocks away. You know, if it was a mile, it wouldn't seem like it was a mile. But you can see the planes taking off and landing. And at one time, uh, one plane had a, I think, a torpedo on it, but it wasn't secured. And as it took off, it fell off and you know, went sky high. So, uh, and that, you know, that that was our excitement. Or the other would be where we'd go down in our truck to go to eat, and uh, we'd pass the end of the runway. Just as we passed it, some plane came through, and you'd hear like a pop, and you'd go pop, 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 and you'd hear you just spray from the field. And if we would have been there, you would have got us. It would turn out to be a Japanese plane, see, a zero. Wow. So, in turn, we had one of the P 40 pilots, they did the same thing. They took off and went for the Japanese, further up, landed, waved to the control tower, and shot them up, and then went home. So, uh, so we uh, stayed, uh, hmm. oh, good enough, on it. okay. Then they, they figured, okay, we're going to make a move to the big island of New Guinea, mm -hmm. and went to Sadar. The Navy the day before shelled the stuffings out of it, and the palm trees were hanging all over. And at about that time, they gave us jungle equipment, uh, jungle boots that you could strap up that way up to almost halfway up to your knee, and uh, different clothing and stuff. So, and a hammock. You certainly know what they say. The best time you ever want to sleep is in a hammock because it's set up. If you don't fall over and break your neck, <laughs> guys were were learning how they fall over and go right through break their nets. And uh, I ended up getting. I salvaged a, a one hammock that I split the top of the rubberized book, and I made it extensions on my mine so that 
I didn't have to have it low, I could have it high, mm -hmm. and that's still, the wind would take it, and it'd be like a sail, you know, like a sail. So anyway, we, uh, we uh, got into Sadar, and uh, the captain, this nice guy is from New York, and I was from Chicago. I was Italian, and I guess maybe he didn't like Italians. Or maybe, well, there was a time when we got in Manila. I, uh, in a volleyball game, I, they set up a ball, and I whacked one right off his ball head. <laughs> And I think maybe he didn't like me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, that's why I never made sergeant. See, I just stayed corporal, which is a good place because they don't tell me anything. I don't tell them nothing. So, and uh, but um, um, the jungle is something to uh, think about. I mean, all these big trees with the big roots that are sticking above the ground. You know, they're like sails in a way, and uh, met a lot of natives. Um, the women were ugly. Uh, somehow, I guess, where things worked like crazy for, for the big shot men, see. They were in headdresses, and, and uh, uh, so when I was, all right, we pulled into headquarters, and uh, yeah, after a while, they said, oh, we're going to have to move you up someplace else. Uh, we've been enough here. So we folded up our equipment, went down into the headquarters. And uh, this was Christmas of 43. Uh, I was going to pull guard duty about 5 in the morning. And she says I was going to pull guard duty. But there's a 90 millimeter outfit, the cannons, you know, I think that that. They, they had a, what they call a red alert, they shoot five, uh, three rounds, boom, 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 you know, and they knew that planes are coming. So we had dug a slip trench the year before, and uh, somebody at the other end of our, our headquarters was saying, I can hear the bomb base doors opening, you know, they, you can hear the motor roaring. Mm -hmm. And he said, I hear them. So anyway, <laughs> we all dived into our slip trench, I got my face in that corner, <laughs> and uh, when they when the bomb exploded, I guess it was a type where it exploded. It could have been 50 feet or so above the ground, mm -hmm. and it would throw anti-personnel, one foot long anti-personnel bombs, maybe an inch or so, and they, and they would and it would sound like rockets. <laughs> and every time they hit the ground, it exploded. The dirt was in the face, you know, I was, ooh. <coughs> so, and um, after they, after they, oh, they, they were circling the, around us for an hour in their clouds. They couldn't quite spot us. And then finally, when they, so when we, when they were through, we found out that they hit us maybe 10 foot away from our equipment, from our, our slip tracks, because of the clouds. And, uh, Usually, most guys are souvenir hunters, you know. Well, let's see if we can find some pins of these things, you know. Here's a big hole like that that they make. Uh, I said, oh, here's a hole. I said, oh, I can feel the fin. My uh, buddy, I think he probably saved my life. He says, he checked, I'll get you stick your fingers <laughs> off of there. He says, that's a live one. <laughs> so we, we put a little sticker, like a flag, and, and told the, uh, Demolition squads, you know, where some of these were that didn't explode. One hit a, a road that was like right outside the door, struck and didn't go off, but stayed up in the air. You know, stayed up. A truck came by, front wheel hit it, exploded, and that front wheel sailed off like a frisbee. Boom, you know, so anyway. Um, from then on, we, you see, from Sadar, they said, okay, we're going to have to move you guys up to uh, 15 miles away up to a place called Suet. Uh, so we took our little landing craft with a truck on it and it, our, with our equipment, went up, pulled, I think the beach was no wider than this, and then the trees and brush started right from, from there. Feet. And um, uh, it was 
five bodies lay in, in, in a row on the side. They were GI, they were, they were caught by snipers. And, and that was our first experience, and that sort of shook us a little bit. We had to go maybe maybe a couple of, a couple of blocks in uh, to set up our radar. And uh, to get there, we had, we had to go through what they call elephant glass. It's 10 to 15 feet tall. The truck would go, but the torque tube that drives your wheels, it would, the grass would wind up on it, so we had to get under there and chop it with machetes to get it off. So as a result, we had to chop the grass ahead of it so it wouldn't get stuck all the time. And we set up our equipment a couple blocks down, um, next to a little river, a, a trickle, just a little bit. This was the dry season. We had six months of dry season, six months of wet, it would rain every day. Uh, you, if you got dust over your ankles, it, it would turn the mud over your ankles, you know, with all that stuff. But, and uh, the creek turned into a bit of, um, maybe twice as wide as this room. Oh my goodness. It just filled up, and logs from further up were coming through like a freight train, you know, the road. So uh, uh, we built a, a, a observation tower. And we, and we took the palm trees, made four corners, and went up maybe 30 feet, 40 feet, and uh, had, had a platform with a roof and everything, and we'd go up there, and that way you could hear planes that were coming you know, over, and, uh, but we'd be sitting ducked up there, you know, <laughs> all that would be sh shoot at it, but. Uh, when you I, saw planes, or you or you detected planes, what did, what did you do? Did you communicate with somebody, or were you? Well, uh, when we spotted planes, when the planes, we would, we would be able to hear them, someone yell out to me, I hear them, so we get over on the radar to try to track them. Some guys would run to their 50s, and, you know, shoot, try to shoot as they came down. It passed over. We were right in line with the with the airstrip and the jetty, so it make a bounce run on the on the airstrip and on the jetty. And uh, the um, they they made one one pass one time where they always came around eight o'clock at night, and. Uh, we had a cook that made some beautiful, I think it was tarts, maybe strawberry or some kind of tarts, and uh, we made a nice oven out of the 55 gallon drums we had. We had so much time on our hands. Everybody did everything with those 55 gallon drums. Oh. I had a guy talking about making a shower out of them, making a washing machine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we made the floats. We, we turned out to be engineers. When we had these big rains, it washed out this bridge that was out, and we ended up sending a cable across. I got pictures of that in that thing, and we put a, a little uh, police and, and gangs that would ride on the cable, and two guys would sit, straddle and go across. In the meantime, we're building these uh, pontoon bridges with the 55-gallon drums, and then making nothing. And, you know, so you walk across. Then eventually we built, uh, we spun cables to put um, this metal stripping that I used for landing strips, you know, it's, it could be a foot wide, maybe 12 foot long, and they put them together like jigsaws and make it where there's a rough area that will make it smooth. So we made that, and we used that for a while, you know. Um, So we, we, we did almost everything but what we were supposed to do, you know, engineers, uh, and uh, after a while it got to be where everybody was moving out, and it was going to be our turn to put up, to put together and move out again, and uh, uh, before we moved, this one plane, like I said, built 50 engineers in the camp. About a month later, 
we parked our units right there. And I said, it had to be the same spot. I said, okay. Mm. And uh, that was between Suet and Seda. Uh, and uh, then from there on, we went back to headquarters and uh, we go to the Philippines. And um, on the ship, I think we only had maybe, like I said, 1,500 people on this, uh, mostly a Chinese crew. And uh, one of the sailors on the guy says, here, soldier, you can use my hammock. He's up on deck. He says, I work nights, so you could sleep nights and I'll, you know, yeah, and, uh, I'll sleep days. I said, okay. I just kept smelling something terrible. The next morning I got up, this Chinese guy had two or three goats. Right. <laughs> right. I said, oh. Maybe that's why I never liked goat milk. I don't know. But, um, so, uh, and then somehow, I, I don't know, I thought it was kidney, kidney attack or all stones. I went down to the sick bay where they, they always had a nice hospital, you know, in a, in a, in a ship. Everything was white. I got in a cot. And I didn't remember anything for three days. I got up, they were feeding me intravenously. He says, you were probably passing a, a gallstone. I said, well, okay. And the guys thought I was trying to get out of KP. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do dishes or nothing. I said, yeah, well, you got to use your head. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we were going to the uh, Philippines. We landed in the Philippines. Got on their trains, their small trains again, but went three or four miles to, to Manila into an area where uh, it was the uh, Art Conservatory of Music and Art uh, University. And they were holes all over the place. They had holes in the, in this, almost the size of this room. So they had it fenced off. You had to watch out that you didn't sleepwalk and end up in the basement. And uh, they had to fix the roof because the roof was gone, so it was leaking. And uh, I, I went to a USO, a Red Cross in town in Manila, and uh, uh, I looked at their, their book and I looked and I come across a guy that I knew. He's in the Navy. I was his best friend at his wedding, too. Uh, it went later on, years later. And, uh, but he never showed up again. So anyway, um, he met a couple little girls, 14 to 16 years old. They, they did our wash for us. And they, were, they lived 150 miles from us. So I figured, gee, they must have got a lot of wash together before they went <laughs> home. And, you know, they were a bunch of dirty three eyes. But, um, uh, yeah, and we got invited to their house to, uh, for lunch or, or dinner, you know. And uh, they gave us a nice steak. It looked like pork chops. It was caribou caribou meat, you know, like, but we were told don't ever eat caribou meat because it's, it's infested with, with, uh, with uh, it's infected where you would be allergic, but the natives doesn't bother them at all. Yeah. So this guy Harold and I were cutting and we look at each other like it's our last meal. <laughs> so, and, uh, but, uh, so did you get sick from it? No, but uh, I probably got enough shots of me to kill anything. You know, they, they didn't, uh, there's so many things I've forgotten. But then when we finally left Manila, we, uh, we headed for Japan. Oh, and when we, oh, when we were still in New Guinea and we heard about President Roosevelt dying, passing away, we thought, oh, geez. We're never going home. We're never going to win this war. And uh, our old saying was, we'll build the gate by 48, 1948. 
And this was only 43, 44. And, uh, yeah. So we finally went to Japan. Uh, the day before we got there, they had a typhoon that turned a few boats over, you know, some sunk and stuff. As we came in, we passed the uh, Missouri, the one that they signed the documents. And I got some official document pictures of, in that book. You know, really, really neat. Uh, the, uh, while we're still on the LST, uh, they assigned a mess of guys. Here's a mess of jeeps getting it. Learn how to shift on it. You got each got three Bisha areas to patrol. So I stripped the gears a number of times, and I maybe 10 minutes I learned how to drive it. And uh, so we're, you know, we go to these little, little towns, three towns, and got, got acquainted with the people. Some little old lady, she came over and said, you're skinny. <laughs> she come over with tangerines and sweet potatoes, white sweet potatoes. She said she wanted to get me fat because I'm too skinny. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Were you really skinny? Were you really skinny? Yeah. Well. You're pretty skinny it, now. Uh, I got a punch now. I, mean, I, I scared myself when I looked in the mirror. Who's that guy? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, when um, we had it, oh, we spent our time, you know, going on patrol and different things. We we go up the road uh, full speed ahead and miss the sign that says bridge is out. So you know, we go along, so we comes, we tell, but it was raining so hard that the that the, that the road looked like a river. The water was running out like crazy. But anyway, um, we. Um, they offered us a chance to go to Mount Fujiyama for two weeks. I said, hey, okay, I'll sign up for it. And this guy, Edward, the guy, he says, John, he says, if your number gets called up and you're there, you won't be able to go home. I said, yeah, that's right. Well, okay, so I didn't sign up. A few guys that we knew went. They went for two weeks and came back, and we're still there. <laughs> I said, see you, son of a gun. We could have had a good time. He says, we got breakfast in bed, oh. everything. The whole line, I said, oh, all right. I ended up getting a, a nice silk painting of Mount Fujiyama from one of the, an 18-year-old guy that was, he was trained to be a, 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 a kamikaze pilot. And then when, when they found out that didn't need him, they put him in the Merchant Marine too. So I got acquainted with him and his sister. And, uh, but our, when we went to the uh, Philippines, they made us combat MPs. 530 combat. Okay. See, that's why our discharge papers doesn't tell us that we were in the 94th any aircraft, you know. But, but we, they showed us what we did in radar and stuff. So uh, um, we, we learned a few, few things about the combine, how to, we thought when we got on the beach of Japan, it's going to be pretty rough. We're going to have to uh, get guys to go wherever they had to go you know, to be more efficient. But it didn't turn out that way. Um, It was pretty uneventful. It was real nice. Some of their cars and motorcycles, they were so bad, I said, oh, these poor guys are never going to make it. Now you look at their cars and the cycles now, and they put you to shame. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we finally, when I missed that uh, Mount Fujiana thing, I finally got my, my orders to go home. And I got a picture of us on this LSI landing craft. And uh, we were maybe two weeks before Christmas. And it took us two weeks to get across the Atlantic, no, the Pacific, 
to go to Tacoma, Washington. And uh, a ship passes up in the middle. It was the coop coop. They got there in time, they go to Christmas, and they beat us to it. And we're still getting there. We got there January 6th. Oh my gosh. My mother had a Christmas tree with all the needles piled underneath the tree. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it was raining so hard, and we saw, is it, I'm not sure, it's Mount McKinley in Washington. We could see it. But it rained so hard, and it, and it, it depressed you so bad that we said, hey, let's go back to Japan. It's better than, really, you know. Well, anyway, got off the ship, and all we saw was, was no band, music. There was a warehouse. The wall says, welcome home. That was it. I think it was we, we got there early, and we came back late, yeah. and we missed everything. So there was a rumor going on that we were able to buy a, a Jeep for 500 bucks. You know, it turned out just the officers were able to buy it. You know, I had in mind of going from California, you know, all the way home. So, uh, when I got to Fort Sheridan, got discharged, got the uh, train that took us downtown. I think it was uh, probably downtown Evanston, I'm not sure. Anyway, I finally got a cab, took us home. Nobody on the, tr on the train going into the city, or we ignored this whole thing. You know. so that was very, not very nice. Uh, we figured, you know, they'd be packed in the bag. And, and uh, anyway, as we got to our house, the cabbie was eating shrimp. He said, "Hey, you want some shrimp?" I, I never tasted. You know, I came from Japan, but I never tasted shrimp. Uh, and that was it. Got home. And uh, wore my uniform for a week or two because I figured I'm not going to change it to civilian clothes because they'll think I never was in, right? So I got to show them I was in. And uh, I had the uh, what? Corporal insignia, uh, five, uh, five stripes for. Uh, six months is each stripe that you were overseas, and uh, that was it. Yeah, you missed something in the middle here. You wrote down uh, uh, that you went to, you went past the Liberty, and you went through the Panama Canal. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I got on the ship to get out of New York Harbor, yeah, not too far away was the Statue of Liberty, so we wait for her. And we still had our idea that we're going to Europe because they gave us uh, wool clothing. Uh, um, I think it uh, was uh, saturated with anti-gas repellent, so it wouldn't, mm -hmm. and clothes and, and big coats and stuff. So, oh, geez, I don't know, I'm not going to like this winter stuff. So as we're going, now we get into the canal. And uh, some guy down there said, hey, we know where you're going. It's not Europe. Yeah. <laughs> so then at that time, they passed out these little booklets about Australia, see, and the customs and different things. And uh, uh, So they didn't tell you where you were going? No. What happened is when we left Camp Wallace, we headed for California during the night. Yeah. And now we, that was going west. Now we're going east again. Oh. Now, now we started going west. What they're doing, trying to confuse the enemy that were around. See? And then finally, we. And they're going east, and that was it. But we thought we were going to Europe for sure. And uh, one of the fellows I met uh, that I worked with at Bell and Hall, he was a, a fireman, and then he decided to work full time as a tool dye maker. And, uh, th and this is only a couple of years ago. I found out he went on the same ship that I did. He went to Europe on that same ship, and I went to the Pacific. That was, that was funny. So when you um, when you started 
uh, or when you, before you were drafted, were you still working at Weebles? Were you doing something else by then? Uh, I worked at Weebles. Oh, I would say an elderly lady that worked at Posse Auto for the Julie department says, you know, she says, you can get a better job in here. She says, you're working for peanuts. You can get more money someplace else. And so it, it was a matter of months later that I decided, uh, one guy was telling me, uh, uh, yeah, he worked at a shop where they made uh, tool boxes and fishing tackle boxes and, and box, tool boxes for the airport and stuff. He said, this one guy that works in one corner by himself, he can use a guy. I said, does it mean you get your hands dirty? He said, no, I don't, don't want to get my hands dirty. But anyway, I figured, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. So I went to visit him and the uh, guy was a Dutchman. He could, he could have been my father. He treated me like a son. And uh, we're, we're by a time clock, and he, a young lady comes up, and I took off my hat. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> talk, and she said, ooh, a gentleman, I said, please. Anyway, <laughs> um, I worked there, I worked there for 46, I worked there for about a year, I think. And uh, then his name was Mr. Barry. He decided to move out in the suburbs. And uh, let's see. But I'm trying to remember. That was that was before or after I I, I got in the army. Was uh, yeah. But then before I got in the army, I, I went to work for him. So that was before '43, and uh, I worked up till '43. And, and he said, "You know, Johnny said I can get you off because you're working the tools I work for doing, making stuff for the government." He said, "But he says if you ever want to get into politics later on, it'll be a mark against you. Oh, you never were in the army. Who are you? You know." He uh, went over these, he, he decided to move out. So when I came back, they took him back. And uh, I was more or less like an apprentice too than I worked. But I did a lot of good stuff. I did more work in one year that an apprentice that went through the program would take four or five years to do. See, because this guy needed somebody to, so he'd, he'd give me a, a die set and he'd punch a few spots. He says, here's this drill, put it in there and drill the holes. I never drilled through cast iron. And when you drill through it and break through it the other side, it grabs and <laughs> everything it goes spinning. Around. So anyway, uh, I, I, I learned from that, you know, and we'd have like a contest with a, with one of the other workers that worked for the other guys. He could build it quicker and get it into the press before the other guys and so on. But um, So when you when you went away, did you were you married before you went into the army? No, I didn't even have a girlfriend. Oh, I, I had to these guys that were getting your, you know their letters and all that, and uh, I wrote to one girl, uh, one of the young girls that were, uh, she was Italian with with the, with the bunch we grew up, you know, and we would get together, six six seven girls, six seven guys, and and their families, and we get on on a truck. And we'd stand up on the truck and take us out to uh, uh, Milwaukee Avenue, you know, where Villa Benice used to be. Right across there, there used to be a, a picnic area. We'd go to picnic in there. So anyway, I liked the girl, and I, I made a nice, a nice ring like, like this gold one in silver. And I carved out a couple hearts with an arrow to it, and I sent it to her. Now my kid sister, she finally joined the waves, and uh, she said, you know, she said, uh, she's getting serious. I said, no, my sister's scaring me. She, you know, I figured, ooh, so I don't know what I did or how I wrote it. Now, I scared the girl, and she said, you know, I, I lost your ring. So I said, I got a dear John already. 
uh, in fact, but that was the closest I ever had a girlfriend. I, did, I, you know, that was, I know some guys had, but one guy, he was already married, and he bragged that his wife would drive a trailer truck loaded with cattle better than most men. And uh, he could say, Dear John, he says, uh, you know, I'm divorcing you, and uh, I sold your fishing equipment, I sold your hunting guns and all that. And that guy never took a drop of liquor in his life. He went out, he got drunk, he went to the house of ill repute, and uh, Oh, poor guy, he was, I met him after, you know, years later, uh, one of my friends says, hey, you go to Nebraska, why don't you look this guy up? So uh, he gave me three names, and I, I more or less, they're army guys, and I tried to look them up. One guy had a heart attack, and he had to leave the farm and move into the city, and when I went to, to there, he had passed away a couple of months before. He said, she said, he was always talking about you guys. And, uh, uh, so okay, then the next guy, I found out that he got killed soon after he came home. He was driving a, a milk truck that he had, teaching another kid how to drive, and he got in an accident, got killed. I said, okay, now send me the third guy. Third guy, I, I went to the post office, and uh, he said, yeah, he, but uh, he's not here anymore. So I, I went across the street to a, like a drugstore. And I said, uh, I'm looking for this guy. Uh, uh, oh, you mean fats? I said, well, he wasn't fat then. But uh, he said, oh, yeah, he, he lives, he, he moved. He's in Omaha. But I'll have, I'll, I can get his sister that works at a Ben Franklin store and he can talk to her. And uh, he said, by the way, he's been through five wives already. Five wives. After the first one, give him a dear John. So I talked to his, his, his sister and she was very skeptical about you know, what I wanted. And then I, she finally found out what I wanted and, and she gave me his address and we got together, you know, once or twice. And uh, one time we went to visit him. He lived in a little trailer camp. He wore, he wore his army boxer shorts. That was it. He had the uh, little oxygen tubes going to a little pump. I said, hey, uh, uh, Floyd, I said, uh, what's wrong with you? He says, it'd be, it'd be easier to tell you what's not wrong with me. He said, but uh, anyway, uh, we, you know, we shot the breeze for quite a while, and then when I left him, I said, well, we'll see you. He said, yeah. And that was the last. And, uh, and, and I, I, I enjoyed hunting these guys up. It was fun. Because you went to these towns that you would never, ever go. These small towns, and uh, the people are a little different. Uh, so did you, was there anybody you kept in touch with? Uh, that when you were in the service with? Uh, yeah, there was one guy, he was a sergeant, Perna. He was in Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And he would, uh, went winter time, he'd go to Tucson. And he said if you didn't move out of there in time, and got caught with snow, you'd just have to stay there because you could bury. And uh, he's still doing okay. Uh, there was a couple of guys that from Chicago had moved to Sun City, and uh, but there's one. I mean, how many buddy that lives in uh, 31st Street and King Drive? How about the way? He's got a couple of guys. He he they talk on the cassette, you know. And they let, he gets the same cassette back, and he and then he erases. And, Keep talking that way. Um, uh, we had about 150 fellows in our outfit, and there was only 20 of us left. You know, uh, at one time, when we were in New Guinea, 
Stewart, 21, 22, 23. If we were taking bets on how long you're going to live and say, hey, I'm going to live to be 84. And I'll say, hey, I'll take $10 of that. I could have made a lot of money, see. <laughs> but but never, no one ever thought we ever, we never ever get out of there. That's why we teach, had that say about the Golden Gate by 48. Uh, we'd see the Golden Gate by 48. We'd see something golden, but it wouldn't be the Golden Gate. But, uh, so your sister was in the way. Yeah, she, and uh, I didn't like women going into service. No. Uh, you know, then. Now I think it, it's great. But she looked, she looked fantastic, really. She had good blue eyes, blonde hair. For an Italian, that's a little unusual. Uh, grandpa and grandma lived closer to the Alps, closer to Germany and stuff. So who knows, some way back, mixture or whatever. So I could be part, part Kraut, <laughs> you know. You know, I fought him. But, uh, uh, so did you have any other brothers and sisters? No. And, uh, and then it turns out that we only had one son. And I said, you know, we're going to have three or four guys. That's it. You know, girls and boys don't make any difference. We were only lucky to have one. And, uh, so where did you meet your wife? Was it soon after the war? Was it? I, I met her uh, after the war at the same place I used to work, at the Simonson Metal Products. She worked in the next department over where they made springs, you know. They had machines that wound the springs in different sizes and shapes. Mm -hmm. And she did it in the uh, place where they put the springs to cut off the ends, the tails and stuff. And uh, I used to be go, I'd go out with some girls there. And uh, I'd say, well, you know, I, um, I said, I'm, I'm going off Wednesday, and I'm going with the Saturdays. Well, you make up your mind. It's either Wednesday or Saturday. <laughs> So I, and uh, at this moment, uh, she's mad at me. I, I did a stupid thing, and I don't remember. <laughs> I I maybe contradicted her, or whatever. Uh, so very foolish. She's very touchy. Oh, the girls, they, they make us. <laughs> but uh, um, if. Did you join any veterans organizations when you got back? Did you join the American Legion? Or no, the I joined the VFW uh, 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 Canfield and, and, and Higgins. I, I never was much for that, but I joined it just to be, you know, so I did. Uh, in fact, we just re, re signed up for, for, for another year. Uh, I've got a I have to, we got a, a, a VA meeting at the Heinz Hospital. I, I go there for my prescriptions, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if the doctors like it or not. I'm sure they don't, but uh, uh, anyway, I found out from them how to get there. So, so one guy, we have a, a, a bunch of retired Bell and Howell people once a week, anywhere from 45 to 60 show up every week. And uh, at this VFW here on Milwaukee Avenue, um, uh, we, um, okay, I lost, uh, I'm thinking of two words and I lost myself. Oh, sorry, the 40 to 60 people that show yeah. up every week at the VFW? We, uh, I never really worked, uh, I worked, I was a tool vine maker, normally you're at your own bench, you've got stuff to do there. But when things got a little slow and, and they sent me to another department where they had a machine to fix, I was able to do that, or some some machine that would take parts from one, one little feeder to another, come together, another machine would put wires over the other would spot weld them in place. Anyway, I did a lot of things. I, I probably worked for them fixing whatever they had to do fix. But, uh, so did you ever use the, did you ever go back to school? Did you, uh, you went right no, back to I, work? You know, I tried to when I thought I'd, uh, I'll uh, see if I go into school. And I tried to get into a, a, a school involved in maybe two of my work. And uh, 
None of these big places, they would have nothing to do with it. They don't want to exist. It's too drawn out, and they never get paid, see? So I said, okay, I went to, I went to Hardway. I learned at the Hardway for this. Uh, did you, um, oh, you know what? I always ask this question. Did you, being Italian, did you meet a lot of people who were different from you when you were in the service? Was that interesting? Did you meet people from other cultures? Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, one time uh, some black guys, soldiers, came in. I guess they were truck drivers. They're, they're good at truck driving trucks because any of those men are going <laughs> to handle a big truck. Uh, but I never really you know, associated with them because well, at that time they didn't integrate them that well. Uh, yeah, I would meet uh, hillbillies and uh, when I went to visit my son in Missouri one time, I said, you know, I'm not, I'd like to look, uh, see uh, this one fellow. He's a, a little hillbilly, Shinhai, and uh, I told him where he was. And he said, what? I said, well, he said, Dad, you never want to go there. I said, well, I'll bring my 45 if that's, <laughs> if that's what you have to bring. He said, that is a rough place. You, you go in there, you, you never know what will happen. So what, some other guy went there, and, uh, and we found out the poor guy passed away, you know. But I, uh, yeah. That's and then, because I'm nosy, I always ask this question, too, because my mother is a chaplain, so I always ask, did you have church services? How did you celebrate holidays? Um, that kind of stuff. We had a little church on Good Enough Island. Um, and I went to a number of times, not a lot, I went a number of times, because my mother at that time was trying to get me to go to church when I was, you know, 18, 19. And, uh, okay, Mama, go on, go. And here's the, you gotta have a missile. I said, okay, Mom, I'll take it. And, um, and then, as the war wound on, uh, I guess the chapel turned into a, a morgue. And, you know, they, so they have been very, very, uh, but they had different um, services out in the open, in different spots. You'd pass by and there'd be a mess or you'd stop in. And, uh, uh, Did you celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving? And yeah, we had Christmas and Thanksgiving, you know, shindigs. Uh, uh, Chow line, you know. Um, I got I got a two week furlough to go to Australia one Christmas. And uh, to, to get off the island we flew. It, it, it was a it's a DC DC four. It's an old old transport plane. One of the biggest at the time, and, and at Midway Airport, that was the, the, the main plane that they used. And uh, I got on it with two other guys from there. And uh, on board was uh, three or four nurses. Uh, there was a, a major and a lieutenant. They just made lieutenant and just made major. They were uh, infantrymen. And uh, the major would say, Nothing. He was like real quiet. The lieutenant, he spoke. We got, we got to talk, and uh, and I had all of my stuff in a bus, uh, duffel bag, and I just had a little. And it was cold, about three thousand feet off the ground. It gets a little cool. I was, I said, son of a gun. So then we landed in French Haven, off off of the tip of New Guinea, and uh, from there we 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 camped. At like a like a Red Cross place, and uh, well, Red Cross, yeah. And uh, I went in, and there was a, a soldier. He was a flyer. He said, "Hey, you're a soldier." He says, "You can have my bunk." He says, uh, "I'm not going to be here for a while, so you can have it." And, uh, and so we stayed there till another ship would pick us up and take us to Australia. Mm -hmm. I said, "Well, I don't want to. I want to." So I went. I went out to the airfield and I 
so comparing the plane, oh, you're going to Australia, you know. I finally found one that had loaded uh, uh, spare parts and stuff that had to be refixed or something that was going to Australia. So I finally got to lift that way and uh, landed. I got an Eisenhower jacket. You know, it's terrific. And our, our coupons, sugar coupons, and different things that you needed because they were, had rations. And you would give that to whoever you boarded out with. You. So we finally got a boarding house, a regular home, but uh, I didn't like the idea of sleeping in another bed with another guy. But you know, anyway, uh, we'd get up and, and uh, she'd make us breakfast uh, eggs, steak. And whatever, in the morning, was, geez, I was always cereal, you know. And uh, then we take off from there, um, and we tell the woman when we came back where we were. She, you were there. She says, "That's a rough neighborhood." Said, well, we, we were prepared. Uh, the uh, oh, then as we as we're walking outside, we're gonna go. Uh, uh, that was uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, here comes the lieutenant and the, and the major, and uh, he says, "Hey, Corporal, he says, there's so many women out there you can't you can't shake it off with a stick." He says, "You got to go to that beach." I says, "Okay, we're gonna go." He said, "Hey, you're living here in this one place." He says, "Come on over tonight. I'll make you a steak." I said, "Yeah, I thought he was just talking." Okay, because I knew a couple of the guys were from our office were there. In fact. They already, they already were there, and they were going to go home while I was going to stay for a while. So anyway, we went to the beach, met a couple of women, and uh, I forget if we made a date or whatever. Anyway, we went back that evening, and he says, come on, Corporal, to make us, and he made me a steak. That was pretty good. And uh, he, he says, yeah, he says, the major, not in a tight situation a number of times, and he's, you know, he's pretty well on edge, and he doesn't really say too much. Like, okay. Uh, and then, um, oh, one of our fellows, he'd like to drink, and he was sloshed, and he said, John, he says, I got a date with this little girl, Burl, uh, Burl, that's her name, Burl. Anyway, he says, there's a couple of tickets at the ticket office. It's, it's a little theater, you know. You can, why don't you take us? Oh, geez. Okay, all right, I'll go. So I went and uh, knocked on the door, and uh, the girl showed up. And we called her. She was an old maid aunt. Aunt that was there. And I told her, well, this fellow, wasn't feeling good, and he says, you know, why waste the, the tickets? Why don't you go and take the girl? In the meantime, the girl comes up, a beautiful thing. I said, oh, you know, and she says, I said, uh, what they call this and feeling well? He says, I should take his place, maybe take it to this theater. He says, okay, I'll ask Daddy. Daddy says, no. I said, what? He says, he wouldn't let her go with me. I said, you son of a gun. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and I figured, well, I looked at the old maid aunt, and, and there was this little kid. He was in his, in his pajamas. I says, how would you like to go? I says, get, get him to dress up. She says, okay. She did. She got him dressed up. We went to see this theater. I figured it was, it was a play about Yanks and different things. And uh, I don't even remember what it was about much, uh, how good it was. but. Some people in front of us would turn around and uh, 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 they would uh, say, uh, you'll have to excuse, we got a guy playing the Yankee, you know, he's not exactly like him. <laughs> and, and I says, he could do whatever he wants, that's how he wants, so yeah. we had that time. So uh, it was nice, I, you know. Also, the girl, the old, old maid aunt says, well, you know, Burl works at this bank. And she eats lunch out in the park. And what a, I'm a goody-goody two-shoes at that time. Oh, no. If, if that 
I says no, I'm not going to go on back out of that. And I'll, you know, so I, I probably gave up a good chance of meeting what a nice girl. What do you think was wrong with you? What didn't he like about you? I don't think he just didn't like Yanks. Huh. No. Just in general. A Yank is a Yank, no matter who he is. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, 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 yeah, I had I had taken some pictures in the beginning, and I brought the rulers rulers back. Oh, yeah, we developed them there. See, but I didn't have any paper to print them, so I went to a Photoshop in in Sydney, mm -hmm. and I gave them a roll. And who knows how many pictures they printed off by themselves, yeah. you know? But I got I got enough. Oh, I got six, seven, eight, eight prints of the bunch, and uh, when I took them back, the guys wanted to buy them. I said, well. Know. We're dealing in pounds. I said, what, 15 pounds? That's like $30 for just a, you know, seven, eight pictures. And they didn't break an eye. They had their money. I said, okay. So it was. Uh, you must have been a good photographer. I, I liked photography. I wasn't good. I was, but see, there was two other guys. Harold, he was, uh, you know, he took some pictures. And this other guy, Leon. He took some, so I got about a hundred pictures from each guy and myself, three hundred pictures, and I developed them. So I, I got to give credit for all three of us. In it too. But uh, yeah, one guy said, "You know, John, you, you could have been a, a good photo." I said, "Yeah." See, somebody needs to have a push when you're good in something or whatever. You need somebody to give you a push into it to get you started, and, and you could get going. But uh, I don't know if anything else I could. I know I want to get home. I'll say, oh, I forgot. <laughs> I'll, I'll That's okay. I'll, you can tell me that. I'll send you an ear mail. Telegram, you know. Oh, yeah. And this one fellow that got this Dear John letter. He would write two V letters. I don't know if you know what V letters are. Two V letters and a letter every day. I says, you got to be crazy. I said, I'm crazy, but I says, I, they were lucky if they got a letter from me once a month. He says, because you'd have to repeat out, you know, there's nothing new, you, and you couldn't tell them much, except it's raining. And of course, you have told them before when I say it's raining, it means that. We've got incoming calls, see. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Was there anything, did you, did you, um, did having military experience influence how you thought about war or about the military? Did you think differently? Uh, no, I don't think it changed me one way or another that uh, they were bad or good or uh, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how, how strong I was. I know one time, I almost forgot, this was in New Guinea, uh, a, a, a four by four truck pulled into our area in our headquarters because we were parked there, started passing out bandoliers of ammunition, you know, these bandoliers would have maybe eight Eight, eight, and get seven or eight of them. It's pretty heavy. Yeah. I figured, oh man. I said, what's coming out? They didn't say anything right then. And then after a while, it says, there's 14 Japanese barges out, and they're going to make a landing after that. Oh. This is going to show us how well. When I was uh, in uh, Camp Wallace, we went on the firing line. We had our heavy coats, and it was cold. And uh, I think uh, I think this clip on a Springfield rifle had seven rounds. Anyway, one of the positions was to do seven rounds rapid fire prone. So I just shot off bullseye every time. See, so this guy said, alerted the the lieutenant to big shot. Um, <laughs> that I guess, and that's the way he told her I was all bad. <laughs> you know, he says we need more guys like you. So. From then on, I was always picked. If we had a truck to go someplace, I was picked to get on top of the truck 
and looked out for stripers in the in the palm trees, you know, because the Japs were tricky with that. And uh, well, anyway, um, yeah. Another time is that uh, on Goodenough Island, the uh, Pipisaw Louis Range that we had, and we were showing how you know, each, each took turns firing our right our grand rifle, and. Uh, he said, by the way, when we're three quarters of the way finished, he said, by the way, we're, we're, we're playing for, we get $100 and $200 war bonds. Wow, then we start firing like crazy, see. Well, I lost out by one, and so I got the $100, and the other guy got a 20. I'm a marksman, but that, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Did I finish what I was going to write to say before? <laughs> you started with the, the truck that pulled in. Oh, yeah. All right. They gave us the, the uh, band of ammunition, and then uh, we walked out to the, to the edge of the water uh, where they could possibly come in. I said, well, we got cover here. And then up in back of us, in back of the hill, there was a big oval that the Japanese had dug a hole. There's a sniper nest there, see, I said, well, that could be a spot. But of course, those guys would know about it. But anyway, uh, it happened that the Air Force, the P-40, they fell out and they striped them and they sunk them all. About a week or two later, same thing happened again. They took them in and give us a warrant. Hey, again? <laughs> and, and the Air Force took care of that. So we had, we had good flyers. And, uh, that was probably one of the, the very few times that I got scared. You know, you really don't know how you... Uh, the other time I got scared is on the... Uh, you're on the firing lot. You get where the, where the targets are. Right below the target there's a hole with a couple of sandbags and you're in there. And when they stop firing, you get up there and patch it or show where they, where they fired. So, and when they're firing, you can hear the darn things whistling. I said, holy Christ. Huh? You know, bing, bing, bing. You know, I said, uh, see, I don't know. You hear about these guys uh, dragging a 50 caliber and they're getting shot at. And that, you know, they, I don't know. The adrenaline wasn't pumping that much for me then. It just ran out. But, uh, uh, Do you remember anything particularly funny? There probably was, but I forgot. Uh, uh, well, it wasn't that funny then. No. Well, you know, I saw uh, in New Guinea, we'd have movies, you know, maybe a three, four dozen guys would show up and have a movie or, or some celebrity. Uh, one show I saw was a girl called you, uh, actress, you know, you know, you know, a pretty blonde, real nice. I've seen pictures of her years later. She, she looked like Granny, you know, real old. But uh, this one here was Gary Cooper. I just love the guy. He was a great guy. Uh, it was starting to rain. I had my poncho, you know, over, and, and I had my helmet sitting on my helmet. And uh, he showed up, and he, uh, he. Uh, he said some of the lines in, in the movie, uh, um, was, it, was it Dan the Yankee? Uh, one of the, anyway, it, and he says, I don't know why they sent me here. He says, I can't do nothing. He said, all I can do is act, but I can't do nothing. And he's, he's flipping his, the cord from the mic around and he was, you know, goofing off. But, uh, that was about 20. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I thought that was pretty funny. I know when we were going to leave Sadar to go to the Philippines, they had a slated to go to Burma. And they said, you guys are going to get all new equipment. Uh, radars are going to be able to pick up 
parachute out of the parachute. And uh, then uh, somehow it got a big storm, and the docks were washed out, and it got so bad that they couldn't take us off the island. We were the last guys there. And uh, we were making our bread. The bold weevils were still in the flour, so some guy came up with a little automatic sifter. You put the flour in and it sift out the bold weevils. After a while, we said, hey, leave it. That's our protein. We gotta have it. Yeah. We gotta eat them. So then, then after this, before we got to, off the island, we started parachuting our bread down the parachute. And, uh, So you said in, in Japan, when you didn't go to Mount, Mount it, Fujiyama. Fujiyama, when you didn't go, you had a picture because you met a guy and, it, and his sister. How did that happen? How did you meet them? Uh, I, I really don't remember how I met them. I, I, I was interested in getting a sword. Samurai sword, and uh, there was one young kid that worked in the office of a uh, streetcar uh, company, and uh, I talked to him, and he says, he says, wait, when I think too had too much longer to work, he said, I'll, I'll take you to. So I got on the back of his bicycle, you know, and he. Well, a couple of miles on a rough road that we kind of got into, his, I guess, his home. It was dark inside. There's three or four big guys. Said, Holy Christ, they're going to kill me. Yeah. These <laughs> Japanese guys. And the two of them took off and came back with this newspaper and unrolled it. And it was the sword, 900 years old. But they wanted 20 cartons of cigarettes. Yeah. Well, uh, I didn't smoke, but, and I did have the carton of cigarettes. I guess I traded them off or sold them. And uh, I said, yeah, but that's, that's you know, a little rusty. I want it nice and shiny. He says, no, but it's see, 900 years old. I says, well, I'll think about it. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I think the kid told me of a, of a, of a an old guy, 40-year-old sword maker. And this, he lived in this little town. With, he lived in a house that there was a dozen houses in a row. They all looked alike. They, I don't think they even had a number on them. He just, anyway, I was able to find it. Every time I went there, I was able to find it. So he even brought this sword. He, I, was, I want one nice and shiny. He says, give me seven days. I fix it nice. I said, OK, I got time. So he cleaned that up. I'll tell you, it's, at that time it was something like over 350 years old. So now it's over 400 years old. It's got uh, the, the, the little hilt where the, the handle goes through and then the blade comes. It's got gold inlay and stuff. It's little chickens and, and roosters. <coughs> and uh, the handle has a shark skin laid uh, covering now with the black shoestring uh, ornaments and, uh, and and the little bitty knife that they used and it has a little chick on it too in gold when you got nicks on the blade it's used to to, to wipe it in the, to keep the sword in shape see so uh, and, and uh, so I took this to uh, antique show and uh, got in line, stayed in, and got into this table. And this guy was ready to go home or go someplace. He was in a hurry. He said, oh, OK, I'll take you after the lunch. He was so anxious to go that he wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. But uh, I had two cars that said, oh, I had two swords. One was the, the one that was finished, and the other was partly finished. But since they said, hey, John, you're going home, I got it and went. So he says, I could fix it and send it to you. I, and I said, I didn't trust it, but maybe I should have. And that one, uh, one of the guys at, at a sword convention offered me twice of what anyone else offered me. 
It's not for what they offer, I'll give you twice. So anyway, I, uh, I, uh, oh, so the guy says, one had a Japanese face, nice face, and uh, he, uh, he was a beautiful sword, and he says, uh, yeah, it's worth about 3,000. Well, I wasn't very happy with that. 400-year-old should be worth more than that because they show you some guy's got a, a Civil War sword that's rusty to be nothing. It's only 100 years old, and they say 20,000. I said, what? 20,000. So anyway, uh, and then he said, the vase is worth about 500. I wasn't happy with that because I, got, I bought two vases like that. They're identical. And the, on the bottom of the vase is a little square gold imprint with writing in it. And they said, if you can buy vases that are made in pairs, they're valuable. Mm -hmm. So, and this guy was so intent on going that he didn't really put his heart, I said, I wanted to have it on tape so he could have it, you know, on the, on, on the TV. But anyway, okay, that's another story. Uh, I have to find out what I have to use to clean this vase. I don't want to use something to take out the gold or anything else. The uh, uh, ceramic, it'll stay, but the gold stuff and other mites. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, I got a computer that doesn't work. If it did, I'd be able to find out from somebody that's in the line, and say, oh yeah, you got to use this solution, it'll clean it good and safe. Well, I have a company's like computer, so come ask us. Okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to do that. That's what they pay us for. Okay. Uh, so is there anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to no, say? That's about it. That's a, a short run on the three years I've been here. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny, we keep talking about it, and it's only three years out of my 84, and, and why it should stand out that much, you know, I still... It's amazing. It, 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 it was it was the best of times and the worst of times. It, it, you know, you learned a lot. You went through a lot. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we we've forgotten. Uh, you know, uh, I know. We used to get reunions, have, say, about roughly 100 guys show up for the reunions. And uh, it turned out nice, really good. And then that, that one time, I just, after the second or third reunion, I said, oh, I'll get these pictures and I made a board. And there'd always be a five or six guys on each side of the board looking. There's always somebody there. So that was nice. I, I said, OK. I, uh, then after a while, some guys said, hey, here's a mess of pictures. So I was busy today gluing them on, but they're mixed up. Some will be for one batch. I says, whoever sees them, if they know anybody, they'll know that, yeah, this is this guy. He belongs over here or whatever. But uh, uh, but anyway, well, that was a short war. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Okay.